Hi all, welcome to our first presenter for 2024. Um, <clears throat> seeing some pretty random sign-ins on the Zoom side of things, which is cool. Hi Steve, hi Christian. A um, couple other, Shauna Flynn, I'm, I'm assuming it's from BC. We have, yeah, oh nice. Um, yeah, welcome. So tonight's presenter is Pat Demeester. Uh, Pat hails from BC. Uh, we all are pretty familiar with the Skeena and that area for fishing, but Pat is actually from the Salish Sea Basin. So the fjords, um, kind of right across from Campbell River, if you were to throw a baseball east. Uh, found out about Pat through a Facebook group that we're part of called Northwest Spay Fanatics. And just kind of been watching him throughout the past few years and really enjoy his commentary his photographs are incredible um, he is a guide up there and he does offer hella guiding which is pretty spectacular when you combine it with uh, an amazing fisheries and water you know water basin and uh, you know from the mountains to the sea so um, please give Pat a big warm welcome from Santiam Fly Fishers and uh yeah, welcome, Pat. We're really stoked to have you present tonight. Yeah, thank you. Fly I'm casters, really, I should say. Whoopsie. <laughs> really, really excited to be here. Uh, thanks for um, for uh, connecting me with the group, and um, yeah, uh, I love sharing a good trout talk. And uh, we have some unique life histories of some of the strains and species of trout and, no and and char that are. Uh, uh, here uh, on the uh, on the coast, um, like uh, Shandy said, you know, a lot of people are familiar with the Skeena, uh, kind of uh, northern British Columbia, where we have uh, large watersheds that uh, you know penetrate uh, far inland and and have some of the they're kind of the refuges for the last uh, large all wild refuges for steelhead. Um, and uh, and the what I call the long distance runners, um, but uh, the entire coast, uh, you know, well down to California, uh, was well known for steelhead. Unfortunately, we all know um, the the last uh, fifty years has been very hard on uh, on Omicus uh, in the uh, anadromous life history. Uh, uh, all through the Oregon coast, uh, the Washington coast, um, we tried to obviously rebound with uh, hatchery programs and, um, you know, with some success and, and uh, but I don't, you know, I don't see a lot of long term success in a lot of the hatchery programs that both British Columbia and, and uh, Washington and Oregon kind of implemented. Um, here in BC, uh, the pro provincial governments kind of opted to um, go the wild route. So, uh, there are a few small hatchery programs like on the Stamp and the Vetter uh, and several systems throughout British Columbia. But uh, here in the Lower Mainland and on Vancouver Island, uh, the the thought was um, a strong gene pool would, uh, would be better than to weaken uh, the gene pool and have a lot of fish. So uh, we all know uh, what's kind of happened over the last few years, Vancouver Island. I mean, Gold River's a tragedy. Um, I grew up fishing uh, winter runs on Vancouver Island and on the coast here. Uh, and I just, can you guys still see me there? Something just happened here. Can, can you hear can you guys still hear me can see you patches you can see me and hear me yes sir yes yes okay i just lost my uh i just lost my feed anyway if everybody can still hear me we'll go thumbs up and uh i'll just keep going um so uh here on the coast okay click zoom meeting dialogue launch meeting open meeting 
everything was going so well. Uh, Pat, uh, yeah, you. We can still see. We can still hear you, and we can still the the chat session still seems. To, I mean, the Zoom session still seems to be working, but for some reason, our video went away. Okay, uh, I, I'm getting a launch meeting. Uh, Zoom meeting. I'm gonna try some things here. I'm gonna. I might crash everything, but uh, what is going on? We had some flickering at the start of your talk, and then there we go. That might help. At least we got our um, we got our thumbnails back. I can see the speaker. You uh, you can see and hear me. Yes. Okay. Well, we can just continue. Uh, I will need the slideshow, though. Yeah, I can get that up. Okay. We... Well, I'm just going to continue then, and uh, when when we get to the slideshow, there we'll. Sorry about that. Looks like we have the slideshow. Okay. So, uh, so uh, if everybody can hear me, I'll just continue. We, um, so where I live is, you know, uh, where the coast mountains kind of pinch to the sea. So uh, Vancouver Island, uh, Gold River, that whole region was very, you know, uh, famous for winters over the past 50 years and some of the rivers along the coast and the lower mainland the lower mainland here is very similar to the olympic peninsula which i'm sure uh people in the group are familiar with what uh when i look at the map what i find uh is you can really kind of see the coast mountains come from central kind of central Washington, we have that big basin and, and you have rivers that go a long distance. So steelhead need to, to run a long distance inland in order to achieve spawning grounds in, uh, in as far as Idaho. Uh, you have the Fraser River, which is similar, which is a long system, you know, with fish, of course, um, entering up into the Thompson and, and all the tributaries of the Fraser. But when you when you get north of Vancouver, this is where things start to change. So this is where things become kind of unique on the coast. Uh, the weather changes drastically um, once you pass Vancouver. Uh, and the coast mountains, as you can see on any map, kind of um, oh, curtail over and, and, and almost dump into the sea, creating the Gulf Islands between Vancouver Island and, um, and, uh, and the mainland. Uh, creating desolation sound, which is on the map. Um, so I uh, I work and live in uh, Powell River, British Columbia, uh, and here we live along a very uh, thin sliver of land uh, that is uh, between the coast mountains and the ocean. Uh, we don't have a lot of farmland. We don't have a lot of flat um, uh, lands here. Uh, the rivers are very short uh, and become steep very quickly. Um, the further you go north, of course, uh, we get, start to get into uh, deeper inlets uh, and no people. So uh, we kind of live here at the end of the 101 highway, which extends down to um, the South America through the states. Uh, it's all one highway and it, it actually comes up through Vancouver and ends up uh, dead ending in Lund, which is uh, the top of the very top of the Sunshine Coast in British Columbia. Uh, this is the mainland side of what, uh, like Shanti had mentioned, is the Salish Sea Basin. Uh, the Salish Sea Basin extends from kind of the Hood Canal uh, north to Port Hardy, and it's the entire body of water that resides on the inside of the big island. Um, this was renamed uh, years ago in, in British Columbia from uh, the Georgia Strait, uh, which is it's known as. And uh, 
you know, at one time it was a steelhead and uh, trout and char hub for sure. I mean, salmon fishing, uh, Campbell River is well known as one of the salmon capitals of the world. And, and, uh, and you know, along with the rest of the coast, of course, populations have, uh, have plummeted over time. Um, the, the mainland side of the Salish Sea where I live is it starts with immediately uh, the fjord that or the inlet that goes to Squamish and Whistler which you have to take a ferry across to continue up the coast. Um, the next one is Jervis Inlet which is a quite a long zigzagging inlet uh, that goes inland and there's there's no uh, development or I should say um, personal development you know there's industry of course logging and mining but uh, the uh, there's no roads in these inlets. So, you know, you, you do have other than uh, the industry of logging, which has had an impact in the last hundred years, of course, in, in British Columbia, they're fairly remote. Uh, so you need to take ferry, uh, ferries as you go up the inside on the mainland over these inlets. These inlets soon turn into fjords. Uh, these fjords extend into the central coast region of British Columbia. Um, there's uh, the end of the highway, which means there's no roads. Uh, that's it. Your people are boating in uh, about equal, about the 50th parallel uh, north. Uh, there's there's no nothing on the mainland until you get up uh, past the central coast into the Bella Coola and Bella Bella region. Um, the fjords that I'm talking about, of course, north of Pell River kind of extend from um, where, where we are here on what we call uh, the peninsula, uh, uh, all the way up to uh, some of the rivers like the Kalina Clean and the Kalina Cleany. And some of these in these rivers it, penetrate the mountains and, and go quite far inland. Um, and uh, this has allowed uh, some of the, sp the species of fish, uh, trout and char from the in uh, interior to uh, make it to the sea, creating unique life histories of uh, sea run bull trout, for instance, the family that uh, we work with are the Central Coast family, which are um, a unique amphibodromous um, bull trout that uses the, the sea for a, a portion uh, of its time in the summer during freshet. Um, all of the inlets uh, have uh, connections to some of the largest ice fields in the world. So um, when you start to look into some of these inlets, say like Butte Inlet, and you have like the Hamathco and uh, Mount Waddington, which is one of the largest uh, mountains in British Columbia um, from the sea to the peak, um, you have some of the largest kind of ice fields and fjords left uh, on the central coast. You don't kind of see this unless you're interior or at the end of some of the inlets up north or until you get to Alaska, uh, where, of course, things change once again. So being this isolated um, uh, section of the coast um, with very steep geography, I mean, we have mountains that basically climb 6,000 feet out of the ocean uh, in these fjords. So... Um, I'm going to just kind of start uh, on the peninsula where where we are. Uh, I've uh, my my company is the Cutthroat Coast Company. Um, during my uh, time fishing for steelhead and searching steelhead, of course, coastal cutthroat uh, kind of start as a byproduct, but turned into a passion for a lot of fishermen um, because you know they sit in similar waters and similar rivers and. And of course, we've all caught them fishing for steelhead over time. Um, if the uh, we could start the slideshow, uh, Tim, then we can uh, look at some of the um, different cutthroat here. So um, the we're going to start uh, a, away from the ocean, and we're going to look at some of the unique fish that are here on the coast. So I'm working with a couple of um, people. To, on some projects to look at these fish. They're very unique and they're only found in several watersheds that I work in. Um, they're labeled as a coastal cutthroat trout, but I do believe that over time, um, these will get uh, identified as a, a, a new strain. Uh, these, these are just all of my observations over time being in these watersheds. And 
Um, you'll see through the pictures, these fish look very different than the ocean fish we're going to look at next, which you guys will be familiar with. And um, they are large uh, cutthroat. We call them coastal cutthroat. Uh, I refer to them as Salish Sea Cutthroat. Um, they live in large lakes that are found along the coast. And the reason that they gain this, this size, of course, is because they live uh, symbiotically and together in these watersheds with what we call blackfish, which are a very small kokanee. Um, this kokanee is not a man-made kokanee, so it, it's not a sockeye salmon that was created by the damming of a watershed, uh, which we see in many interiors. I, I, I must um, uh, say that it's nice to see the United States removing a lot of dams. Uh, it warms my heart. I see stories all the time. Um, unfortunately, we're not moving in that direction. We're behind the times there, but um, the we did dam uh, a, a lot of systems. Um, but here, uh, these fish are all generally found above barrier, and they were they kind of the thought is that they come from static rebound. So when the when the land after the shield receded rebounded uh, you know hundreds of feet 250 feet in some places here then um, a lot of these uh, fish got lifted up in the watersheds and these these blackfish or these kokanee are actually closer related to their ancestor than they are sockeye they're about six inches at a maximum length most are four to six inches at spawning and uh, they're a burgundy color or a black color and you know, there's the second picture. Now these are these are the so these are adfluvial, um, or what I refer to as a nomadic adfluvial, because there's kind of cycles within cycles that I haven't quite keyed into, uh, where fish move around. I, I don't believe they spawn in the same place every year. I think that they um, transit lake systems and river systems moving around where the best kokanee population is gonna be. And I think there's cycles that are larger than me that I, I haven't quite seen yet. Um, but the, this fall, we had an amazing uh, kokanee run and uh, the uh, cutthroat season has been, has been really uh, good uh, since about October when the small kokanee entered the streams. Um, these, these particular fish are, are, are unique in several ways. Um, we have lake spawners and, and shoal and swamp spawners. Um, but the, uh, the fact that we've already had a huge, um, spawn is unique to here and endemic to here. Um, uh, there's not, uh, it, uh, too many places where there's thought to be fall spawning cutthroat. And I don't think there's any recording of fall spawning coastal cutthroat anywhere on the coast. And these fish have been spawning since late October. Um, so there's a batch that basically follow the kokanee run and spawn um, right after the kokanee have finished uh, their spawn. They feed on them uh, during the during their spawn. Um, they they get quite large. Uh, you know, a 30 inch fish would be a, a, the top top of the line fish. Uh, but uh, you know, 20 to uh, 25 fi inch fish are caught uh, regularly. Um, making it a, a, a complete wild trophy uh, coastal cutthroat fishery. Um, the uh, the lake fish are very different from the ocean fish. We can skip to that next photo there. I think there's a, a, a good whack of this. This fish was actually caught uh, yesterday. Um, um, I was out with uh, with a friend of mine and we uh, we got several fish in the uh, and lost several fish that were in that 25 to 30 inch range. Um, this is a large male post spawn. Um, and uh, he would have had a little more weight um, before the spawn. Um, but you're at the same time, we were catching fish that are pre spawn. So the genetic diversity in these runs is, is so broad because you have fish that are basically spawning from October till May. Um, and, and they're in the lake. We're not targeting them ever uh, in the in the river on a on a spawning bed or anything. But um, you will get overlap of fish that are spawners and fish that are fresh. Um, let's see the next uh, slide. There, there's a large male from the spring. This is a spring spawner. Uh, these photos are all from this past season. 
So this was um, in the spring, uh, uh, about April or uh, late March, um, when the fish uh, got enough water to kind of get up onto the uh, the gravel in their lakes. Um, so uh, this is long after the kokanee run, and those what we kind of see the two uh, influxes of of fish each season. In the winter, uh, like a winter like this this year, we'll see a lot of the fish spawn say uh, in the end of January and February, whereas on a winter that's not an El Nino year and quite cold, you'll see a, a spawn in the fall and a pause and a spawn in the spring. Um, and in between uh, lots of staging and feeding. Uh, these fish feed on kokanee in open water in the summer and they follow the kokanee. So they, they, they're down deep, uh, similar to like a spring salmon uh, would be in the ocean feeding on herring during the day. And in the evening, as the, uh, the kokanee follow the chronomid and the hatches up to the surface, the cutthroat follow them up and feed generally at night in the summer to avoid the hot temperatures. But come October uh, till April, these fish can be found in anywhere from, you know, four or five feet to about 25 feet of water. So generally we'll, we'll um, the fishery I find is fairly unique. Um, we use electric motors and, uh, and sinking lines and uh, we'll go and uh, what we call dredge, we'll go and pull some large streamers around until we locate a pot of fish. And when you locate a pot of fish, if you mark them um, or, or know where they are, you can come back and cast at them, which is a, a much more exciting way to catch fish. Um, on the strip is of course, uh, you know, the, the one of the most exciting ways. Sam took a 27 inch fish yesterday on a dry line uh, in about 20 feet of water on a dry line and uh, and a sculpin. So that was exciting because that fish rose quite a ways in the water column to come and, and take that pattern, which was no more than three feet under the surface. But they're a cold water fish and the fishery is winter, which is, you know, uh, you it may not be unique to the West Coast, but of course, to the rest of North America, it is. Um, let's let's continue with the... So uh, there's a there's a post spawn male. Um, uh, we can skip a couple here fairly quickly. The lake fish, um, just beautiful. You can see the diversity in color. There's that stone cold kind of blue or gunmetal blue, I call it there. Um, uh, that's a female fish um, post spawn, and uh, and the females will kind of hold those purples and those blue hues and that metallic blue and the boys look very much like a rainbow, very large red gill plate, red stripe, red bar. Um, and you can see with the coastal cutthroat in uh, general, even the sea runs, you don't, unlike a Lahontan or a West Slope or a Yellowstone, you don't see the large slash uh, protruding on the outside. You actually see it when they, when they breathe and they open the gill and the folds, you'll see um, some color, uh, but it's not as prominent of a slash as some of the um, strains of cutthroat found throughout the continental U.S. Let's uh, see the next one. Uh, there's a nice double header. Uh, that was in January on a warm day. Uh, I think these are both fish that were post spawn. Um, and, uh, you know, we got into a decent pod and took fish of similar size. You can see the coloration is beautiful and you can see what I'm talking about, the bottom fish. You can't really see that slash, but that top fish yawning, it's very prominent, right? The next one, there's a beautiful fish from the fall when they first started to show up and follow the kokanee in and stage, um, a very bright red slash on her. And uh, at this point, um, we find them in the lakes uh, staging in historic spots where the kokanee would gather um, closer to creek mouths and river mouths and shoals where they're known to be clear of to, of silt and debris. Um, so the uh, this at that time of year, you can actually take these fish on dry flies uh, in the morning, in the afternoon. Um, but we were fishing, these fish are all taken on minnow patterns throughout the day. We'll skip to that next one. That's a nice photo of just a large male that I got in the spring. It was kind of the end of the spring before they start to return to the depths um, and uh, go back to 
Mendon Kokanee for the summer. Um, let's see the next one of him. All right, so the, those those fish there are, uh, like I said, ad fluvial um, fish that are uh, lake fish that feed on kokanee and, and gain um, kind of an, a, 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 a they gain a large size, uh, which is uh, not really seen in a lot of places. We have large fish, of course, on East Vancouver Island, and we have large fish um, that are found uh, on the mainland. Now, as the shield receded, something happened here in this peninsula that was unique. Something happened uh, in order to, uh, to separate these fish with the kokanee for a period of time. Um, there was... Uh, after the last main ice age, there was a kind of a resurgence and a refreeze at one point, and that could have something to do with it. It also could be uh, that it took longer to um, to recede here, um, since we are so close to some of those larger ice fields. And if you look at the maps um, after the, the meeting, or if anybody's looking at a map now, um, you'd see that ice field in behind, it extends over to Squamish. It extends up to the Hamathco, it touches into Toba, it touches into the back of Goat Lake and the, all of the inlets that I've been speaking about all kind of come off the same massive ice fields there. Um, these would have been, uh, we've all seen the pictures of Alaska. We've all seen the pictures of the uh, receding uh, glaciers that are there in the last 20 years, even just the dramatic re recession. Um, I couldn't imagine what this place looked like 400 years ago, 500 years ago, um, in places where the ice is fairly close to the ocean. As we go north, it must have been um, fairly close. So I think that some of the populations of fish here, we're still seeing uh, actual colonization uh, in some places, which is unique. Uh, I mean, fish, are, uh, we're, they're always colonizing a watershed and adapting to the watershed, but um, I don't think it was that long ago here where we saw ice almost coming right to the sea. Um, so the next little um, batch of fish that I put some pictures up are uh, saltwater cutthroat, which um, I, I know extend down to California. And, and I'm not sure how many people are familiar with um, the sea run cutthroat or, or how prominent they are in your waters, but they are found everywhere. I love sea wren cutthroat. I have fallen in love with this fish. Um, they are uh, they are unique to uh, the coast here, of course. And there's been some reclassifications of cutthroat uh, in the United States from Binky's work over the last couple of years, or, or just in the last year, and and uh, the rewriting of some of the ideas behind how uh, cutthroat and salmonids populated North America, the West of North America. Um, I, I, coastal cutthroat to me are very ancient and I feel like they're very, they are probably the closest related um, cutthroat to rainbows or to micus. They behave very sim similarly. Um, and here uh, in Washington state, of course, there's the Puget Sound, which is known for uh, big populations and there's many great studies and people doing awesome work there. There's actually a dinner, I believe this evening to celebrate the work that happened this season. Um, here, you're looking at a small sea run cutthroat that was caught in the ocean. This isn't river mouth fishing. This is the actual, uh, like quite a ways uh, out in the full salt. Um, so these these fish here, uh, whether they would be identified as anadromous or am amphibodromous, depends on the actual population and each population like steelhead is unique to its watershed. There's lots of small streams in British Columbia that are only bear, pink salmon, chum salmon, a few coho, and a good population of sea run cutthroat. Um, the work that me and Darren Moore are gonna be doing uh, over the next season and what me and, uh, and Brad and Pete and uh, several others have been reporting this fall is um, a, a, we're doing a piece on sea run cutthroat first because I believe that it's important uh, as an education tool. Sea run cutthroat are um, sea run cutthroat are each and every one of our responsibilities. Each population uh, is small and it's endemic to its watershed. They will stray from watershed to watershed, depending on 
of course, the the geology of the beach. Things kind of change as you get north, and you have a lot more isolated populations due to um, steep cliffs and and deep water surrounding small watersheds. These fish are definitely less likely to travel uh, than, say, fish in Puget Sound or East Vancouver Island, where fish can travel quite a distance uh, and will actually enter, uh, you know, fish from Black Creek on Vancouver Island, on East Vancouver Island, have been found up the Oyster River feeding on salmon eggs in the fall or salmon fry in the spring, but they always go back to their home stream to spawn. So there is, you know, uh, on those long, shallow beaches and those sounds and, and places where you have those, um, that kind of a, a, um, a habitat, uh, they will travel. But when you start to get into where we are, a lot of these populations are isolated. So they'll have several saltwater places that they go, but they don't really cross over genetically a lot. They seem to really stay uh, to their creek and they, they may even travel a kilometer away from the river mouth, but they are, they are uh, a lot more uh, isolated to their streams here. Um, so each stream along the coast in Oregon and Washington and British Columbia and each community is kind of responsible for these fish. We can't blame uh, commercial fishing. We can't blame um, seals and sea lions. Uh, we can't blame um, the, the taking of fish in the Pacific pasture. These fish don't migrate. Uh, these fish are in our backyards. They use our backyards as spawning grounds. They use very small streams with some small substrate to to um, lay their eggs. And when it comes to some of these small populations here, I see populations that use fresh water literally for a week, a year. They come in, they lay their eggs in the spring and they leave and that's it. The general life history of these fish in a larger river that has a sustained salmon run would be fish would come in, which we see a lot of, fish will come in and follow salmon in in August and they'll eat eggs in preparation for their spawn. As Soon as the salmon disappear, they'll continue up the stream, entering small tributaries and getting up to uh, very small uh, tributaries of tributaries with the right temperature and the right size substrate. And they'll spawn from basically January till spring. Um, the You'll see a, a wide range of genetics in a lot of these rivers. You'll have just like you have summer steelhead and winter steelhead and fall steelhead and a spring run, you'll see um, a, a good population of fall fish that do just like I said, they'll follow that salmon run in and and have kind of that classic life history. And then you'll have spring run fish that come in in March, April and spawn a little bit later in the season. Um, that's a good sign, of course, uh, having a broad spectrum of, of genetics like that um, within the system. Um, but I, I really kind of stress that if we keep clean beaches and we watch how we develop small streams or tributaries of main arteries, um, we'll have sea run cutthroat fisheries forever if, if we take care of them because um, they, are, they do face different challenges, sea lice load, temperature, um, of course, development of these streams. Um, so that's why I think mapping projects are important, identifying habitat is important and just because somebody buys a small uh, a property with a small stream and they don't see anything in there it doesn't mean that there isn't fish that use that stream for a, a, a portion of the season let's skip through some of these sea run cutthroat a little bit i want to um show you a couple of these fish these were all caught in the ocean this summer in july on the oyster bed um and uh along the shore of uh, of between islands where we get some flushing. Um, can we skip to the next one there, Tim? Can't see that screen. I'm just I'm still on the first picture. I'll be darned. Okay, let me get out of uh, PowerPoint and, and come back in. I mean, yeah, somehow it's not advancing for you guys. It's advancing on my computer, but hold on a sec. There we go. That was it. Right, I'm going to 
stop and start sharing again. So in the summertime, of course, we're fishing on the tides. We tend to fish in shallow water along the oyster beds when it's moving. And um, when you get a good ripping tide, of course, they're feeding and taking advantage of uh, bait that's being uh, kind of pulled through small islands and along beaches. So we spent a good chunk of, of July just um, exploring some beaches this summer for this season. And we found some uh, good populations around different rivers that we fish. Um, throughout the season, just, just trying to dial in some areas. Uh, I know that the Puget Sound, like I said, is a, is a well-known kind of sea run cutthroat fishery. Um, here, the populations tend to be fairly small and they fluctuate uh, between sizes. Some years you'll have a lot of fairly large fish and then those fish kind of fade away. Sometimes you'll see river, a lot of creeks go in about five to seven year cycles of large fish. Any luck with that, Tim? Yeah, we're seeing it here in the room, but I'm, I'm having. All right. I'm not sure what's going on here, Pat. One second. Let me see if I can start again. Can't see it from where I sit. this might work. There we go. All right, so well, well, hopefully this uh, this continues here. I think it will. So here's a here's a fish. Uh, we're gonna actually see a couple of pictures of this guy because he's an interesting story. Um, got got this fish uh, in full salt water between two islands in a rushing what we call a salt river, um, a stretch between two chunks. It kind of flows both directions according to the tide. Um, um, saw saw him eat. You can see the beautiful dots on the eyeballs, and you get the yellow. The older they get, they tend to hold the yellow during their time at sea. And you can see kind of that that bull-like shoulders that he has there. He's got the small head from his recovery, and he's just putting on the weight. Um, we skip to the next one. And then we saw that one. Let's skip to the next. So here's the same fish. And th so this is, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what happened. So this was in um, late July, I believe. Um, and uh, we had, I had just caught this fish, uh, took some pictures. I saved him on my phone, that picture prior with the spots on his eyeball as my screensaver, because he was just so breathtaking, a very chunky fish, um, maybe 18 inches, uh, uh, 18 and a half, I think he was, uh, because he gained an inch and a half between this point in July and November and late October. If you skip to the next picture, this is him. And we caught him five miles up a river uh, in early November, late October. I believe it was early November. So uh, the, the end of the day, Pete, we had landed 20 fish and Pete landed this boy. And I said, wait a minute. I said, I recognize that fish. And sure enough, when we pulled out the pictures uh, and lined up all the, the dots, uh, this is the same boy. Um, you can see he's lost the lump behind his neck and he's actually just, it's just smooth. It gained uh, a good chunk of weight and an inch and a half in length uh, before he came in, in just that like four month period, um, get, you know, taking advantage of that saltwater diet. Um, so we, we dubbed him yellow beard and maybe we'll see him again. Uh, very healthy fish. Um, so let's skip to the next one. That took him out of the whole picture.
Are you still there? I'm yeah. still here. I just I just lost the uh, the slideshow though. We did too. I'm gonna bring it back. I'll bring it back. No problem. So um, the sea run cutthroat life history, of course, is is uh, just like the micus life history of you know these fish uh, push into into the interior as far as they possibly can in a watershed and climb to every lake and swamp and and slough that they can. And they stash genetics, uh, just like Micus does. And they stash, you know, the life history of adfluvial fish in the lakes that connect to the rivers. And they, they'll they leave resident fish or residualized fish, which most steelheaders catch and call resident rainbows, which will be just the offspring of steelhead. Um, or in this case, cutthroat, there'll be resident fish that stay in the river. Um, always having a ocean population, um, and a, a river population and lake populations ensures their success within the watershed. Um, so let's skip through uh, these because I think we've seen these ones already. Let's skip through the fee runs. Can you hear me, Tim? Yes. I I'm attempting to skip through, but but you're not seeing it, huh? No. Damn. Okay, That's gonna... okay. We're going to skip over to the rainbows, I think, now anyway. All right. Let me see if I can get it back up. For some reason, this, the sharing is not working um, very well here. Um, well, if you, about if, you, if you try and get through to uh, to the rainbow pictures kind of at the end there, and I'll start to explain as we move north here. So, um, of course, sea run cutthroat are found in all of the watersheds um, fr from California to Alaska. Um, they go inland uh, in some of the northern watersheds the furthest. Um, as you kind of move north, uh, a lot of the watersheds that uh, you'll see photos of uh, and and uh, I post about are some of the helicopter fishing um, access rivers that we fish. Um, they we they hold different life histories of familiar trout and char. So the fjords, of course, have a huge freshet, and when they do, um, you know, if you look at say Butte Inlet, for instance, or the some of the the uh, let's use Butte as an example. It's 65 miles long. Um, and when it dumps in the spring and you have the freshet, it will be discharging the same amount of water as the Mississippi River. Um, that's a lot of fresh water. Um, so what happens is when you have a 65 mile inlet with 3000 foot walls on both sides, is you form a freshwater lens or a brackish lens that can be 15 feet deep in a lot of places in the fjord. Um, that mineral rich water uh, mixed with the salt water, of course, lots of life. Um, there's lots of uh, activity in the ocean during the meltdown in the uh, river. The, the At this time, what what I've been observing is that the rainbow rainbows, I'm familiar with the bull trout, but the rainbows themselves also do the same as the bull trout and the sea run cutthroat. Um, we're familiar with, of course, the Omicus life history of steelhead, which is a, an adramus rainbow trout. Um, the, ad, ad, the the other life histories that I mean they can that can occur with Omicus are are broad and they're different from all over Western North America. Uh, I I've heard up to over 50 different uh, life histories can be represented um, in in Omicus. But Amphibodromus fish um, are a, a fish that uses the ocean for something other than its adult life history. So anadromous, of course, are like salmon or, or steelhead where these fish are going to the ocean, doing a migration pattern, living their, they're growing and living their entire adult life at sea and then using the river to spawn. 
Whereas the rainbows that I'm talking about, from my observations and speaking with um, biologists that I work with, um, it's very likely that these fish are exiting the river during freshet because it's so cold and there's no bug life and it's a torrent of colored water. Uh, they leave the river and use the freshwater lens, just like the bull trout and the sea run cutthroat do, to uh, take advantage of the bounty that's found in the fjord and at sea. Um, some of these fish may go through the chemical change and actually hit full salt, but it, being in the ocean and seeing bull trout jump around the boat uh, close to the surface when we're uh, fishing for salmon, for instance, um, is a is a key sign that these fish are living in that lens. Um, the the bull trout of the Central Coast family are are definitely doing this, and and um, we're gonna. Can you skip ahead to the rainbows there, Tim? Is that possible? I don't know. <laughs> be I about. Kind of, uh, I think it'll, it'll, this thing. it'll be about twenty five. I think on the list. I I am I am there in the room. But for some reason, I can't get it into Zoom, uh, even though I'm sharing it from within Zoom. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, no problem. So I, 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 it's you know we've been catching these rainbows for years when we go up, and usually when we're up there, we uh, we do as many life histories and species of trout and char as we can. So we'll leave in the morning, and each client will get one steelhead. Uh, once each client has one steelhead, we'll move on to the next watershed uh, and and just kind of cap it at that. Um, and we, we move on and, and look for sea run cutthroat, sea run bull trout, and the, these rainbows that we refer to as sea run rainbows. Um, this season, um, I saw some of the largest fish and some of the signs of, of anadromy um, that kind of really clued me into what was happening in the spring when the fish uh, late late spring early summer after freshet when these fish were returning there's calcium rays um, sea lice were seen um, and uh, <laughs> the overall sil super silver uh, appearance like salmon or 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 steelhead at first um, but none and none of these fish look like steelhead they look like a river rainbow um, this year we saw some large fish Jeff Abel's um, was uh, was fishing a pool and he had a fish that had to go 10 or 12 pounds and we had it at our feet several times and looking at it, it was clearly not a steelhead. It was spotted all the way around the belly um, and it was very deep. Um, these fjord rivers have huge runs of salmon. So they have, you know, we'll start in the summer with, or May or June with white springs. Um, you'll see pink salmon and early coho summer steelhead showing up and with the bull trout and the amphibodromus rainbows and the cutthroat in the early fall. And then you'll get more pushes of coho with the chum and the red springs and continually uh, having fish in the system that are um, that of trout, trout and char that are obviously uh, there to feast on the bounty of, of eggs. And then as the salmon thin out, of course, the bull trout spawn and the pod up over the winter and the rainbows uh, find their uh, tributaries that they're going to be spawning in in the spring and uh, the cutthroat have already spawned uh, over the winter and are dropping back come spring everything waiting for those those salmon fry to hatch and uh, the one of the triangulations I kind of put together this year observing the grizzly activity in some of the it's dense grizzly populations in these areas um you know it's it's not quite alaska but um they're small coastal uh bears and uh and they're plentiful um i do see a, a, a absolute symbiotic relationship between the grizzly bears dragging salmon up out of the river um into the sands eating some of them and and leaving them there the, then every fluctuation every day with the melting of the glacier will bury these carcasses. Um, it gets very cold up there quick, so they'll freeze and they turn into what I call fishicles. And you'll be walking along in, in November and you'll trip on frozen 
salmon carcasses that are sticking out of the sand. Um, this is a really important uh, part of the cycle because if it wasn't for the grizzly bears uh, pulling these fish up away from the river and um, into these large sand banks and sandbars, um, the bull trout would starve. Uh, each high water, the a little bit of each carcass gets washed downstream. So flesh flies uh, are the spring pattern and the, of course, um, egg, egg patterns would be productive in the fall. Um, but if we lose the salmon runs of chum and spring that get hauled up by the grizzly bears, or we lose the grizzly bears, we will definitely lose the bull trout and potentially the in, the rainbows and the cutthroat are doing the same thing. I mean, uh, salmon flesh at that time of year, there's very little in the watershed and each rain, it's like releasing a slow release food packet. Um, and what I'm talking, when you, we get in, when we sit down on a, if you find a pod and you sit down on a pod, you know, we'll spend an hour there, but there'll be a hundred bull trout in a pod and they're all schooled up waiting for that. And I've seen them strategically placed in these pods throughout the river below these large sandbars, specifically, I believe, to, you know, um, take advantage of these carcasses that you'll still see meat on bone in March. Um, you know, so uh, they are uh, taking advantage of that. Um, I was the last, uh, we finished our fall season and um, Art Lindgren came out. Uh, we did a um, a run with Dan Holder, and uh, Art had a wonderful fish uh, to end the season there. It was about six pounds. Um, but the strength of these rainbows is incredible. Um, that day, we were just about to leave, and I looked downstream, and I could see Art about 300 feet down with the uh, fish on. So I ran to catch up with the net, and the time I got to him, he had no I couldn't see his fly line. Um, he was well into his backing and chasing the fish down out of the first run. It had entered the second run and uh, and into the third by the time um, we kind of caught up to him. Uh, it's the strength of those particular rainbows that blows me away. I've caught a lot of steelhead. Um, we're all, a lot of us are in love with steelhead. Uh, you know, uh, the, the saltwater life history of, of our rainbows, but these fish particularly, they don't go on a big migration pattern. Uh, they are river rainbows that use the ocean for a small period of time. Here's one here. This is the fish that Art landed um, just at the end of our day. Um, and the the strength and the resilience of these fish, because they, they have the power of the river rainbow, but they feed in the ocean for a period of time. So they get both of those bonuses. Um, of course, you, you know, playing, you have to worry about taking um, energy from, from steelhead. Steelhead return to the river with a, with a purpose. They return with a, with a specific mission with enough fat reserves to, to make that happen. Whereas these fish tend to be, in my mind, a little more like brown trout. Um, they find, they have a hole, they hunker down, they find their, they find their run and their spot and they feed and they don't really move that far. A lot of these rivers don't have, um, any gradient to them for a long ways. They're, they're glacier rivers that cut through the coast mountains. Um, so um, it's been uh, a journey this year, kind of uh, investigating, and I look forward to this season getting out and putting a little more time into uh, with clients. We're going to be collecting some scale samples. We have um, a biologist uh, is lined up to do some reading, and uh, we have a couple of projects in the go for the bull trout the local cutthroat that we were speaking about and the um, amphibodromus rainbows to kind of, you know, identify these life histories of the trout and char that we all love to, and to understand them and then also to be able to protect the habitats that they use. Because if we don't know that they're using these habitats, uh, you know, they get used. I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll leave it at this, which would be, uh, and we'll we'll do some questions for uh, and some discussion. But um, one of my favorite uh, quotes is is Barry Thornton: uh, "An unfished river has no friends, and uh, unless you have people out on the waters and uh, and eyes on the water, um, there's every industry that wants to take advantage of the watersheds. 
and to be able to identify and observe, um, not just uh, placing it on the federal and provincial uh, and and state governments, but um, you know, I do believe that uh, um, uh, you know, citizen biology is uh, is key factor, and being involved in clubs like this and having uh, an influence on the fishery and what happens with the watersheds is huge. So it was a real pleasure being able to kind of share these life histories of these fish um, that I that we get to see. I feel very fortunate and blessed to live where I do. Um, and uh, it was really nice to be able to come and kind of share uh, that with you. I it would have been nice to kind of pop some questions in between uh, because there was a lot there for uh, different life histories and different strains. But um, if we can, we can definitely kind of open the floor. We've been an hour. So um, if there's anybody that has any questions or uh, discussions, uh, let's open the, the floor to that if we can, eh, Tim? Yeah, I'm sorry about the PowerPoint. I don't know what was going on with it. It was fine for a while. And then all of a sudden, the screen went blank. And when it came back, nothing was working. So we could see your PowerPoint as you were talking about it, but you couldn't see it. And then if we got it to where you could see it, we couldn't see it. So hey, it was you know what? That's a, that's OK. I, 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 as long as everybody kind of got to see some of the fish that I was talking about there and and I came across clear. Um, I, I think this was uh, I really enjoyed this. So. Well, we Thanks. saw some beautiful pictures of fish, Pat. So for you in the Zoom audience, go ahead and unmute yourself when you want and uh, ask a question and I'll take questions in the room. Now, uh, if anyone has a question, go ahead and raise your hand, please. There's, there's some questions, hold on. Hold it close to your mouth. Um, I, I got a couple questions. My first one is, Okay, my name is Bob Riediger. Um, you might recognize that name, Pat. Uh, <laughs> I could skip my second. I'll say my first question is that um, all this diversity of life history on the your part of the coast there, I'm wondering, does that with the cutthroat and all extend up into Alaska, or is it something unique to the Salish Sea area? I would think, okay, so I I really don't know a lot about um, the North Coast. Um, there's a lot of people working on a lot of things up there. I do know that coastal cutthroat um, extend up that far. When it comes to the Central Coast bull trout family, one of the things that um, through the DNA collection that I've been doing um, off, I was we were collecting DNA eight, 18 years ago for the province. Um, I, I think we're going to be kind of getting back on that track with them so that we can um, try to identify where the northern bull trout family and the central coast family blend. Um, the one thing I always found interesting was um, in discussions with um, friends from the south, um, people always understood that they are were under the assumption that Dolly Varden were the saltwater life history and bull trout were the freshwater life history of the same species. And this discussion has gone on and on for for days. Um, but, you know, of course, we we found out in the 90s that they were different um, species altogether coming over from Asia at completely different points. The one big difference between Alaska and British Columbia and the coast here is that um, once you seem to get past the Skeena, um, it switches back over to Dolly Varden. So all those rivers in Alaska that are full of salmon, generally are, they're full of Dolly Varden um, and they don't have sea run bull trout. Uh, there's several different families of bull trout and the central coast being the other anadromous family or, or saltwater family. The south family actually came out of the Skagit River in Washington and migrated north and south down to the Ho and up to the Squamish and populated those watersheds out of the Skagit system at one point. Where, So to kind of answer your question, the 
the a lot of the life histories here are unique. I think we all have unique life histories of trout and char in our communities. I just think that places where there's large populations, of course, we didn't understand that until we ruined them. So there's there's lots of places where we don't have that diversity anymore. Um, I'm very enthralled with some of the Northern California steelhead populations and Oregon steelhead populations and what they do in the ocean compared to the fish that are north of the Columbia. And I have theories on why that is and why their migration patterns are different. Um, but I would say that these fish here are the cutthroat in the lake that you saw that are large are endemic to definitely the Salish Sea Basin and maybe just a small handful of watersheds on the mainland side. Okay, and, and I guess my second one, just because this is an angling group here and um, I mentioned with my name, I'm actually going to be up fishing with you in the end of February. Yes, but, you and your brother are coming, I believe. Yeah, and, and I guess as an angling group, I don't want to sidetrack your other talk, but could you mention for a minute, what, what is your, your guiding business? You know, there's other people here who might be interested so I, 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 my company is, um, it's half guiding and half consulting. So I do, I kind of share my time that I put, that I devote to work between um, taking people and introducing them to these life histories and, and different types of trout and char, and then doing consulting work for the private and provincial sector um, when I, when I can. So um, my company is, is Cutthroat Coast. Um, like uh, Ashanti shared my, uh, post earlier um, as you, you guys booked when I opened up my my four month period for the winter I just opened up my July August September October kind of that help what we're talking about you know steelhead and bull trout and and this the different species of salmon tend to be bycatch when we're targeting them um, I just opened that up to bookings um, just just today um, so I mean if anybody's interested in um, in, in learning more or having a discussion about what it takes to kind of meet some of these trout and char, they can definitely reach out to me on Facebook. I don't have a website. Um, I, I do have an email address, which I can share, but I generally, um, I use Facebook for everything. It's my one platform. Um, and, uh, and it's kind of my fishing diary. So people are welcome to send me a friend request. You're, they're welcome to go back through, and look at the last couple of seasons and look at the pictures and the videos and, and kind of look at the different fisheries that we do. And if there's anything that interests anybody, they're welcome to reach out. I've got a couple questions too. Uh, you talked about Kokanee. Yeah. Oh, sorry. My name is Todd York. I'm from Salem. Hey, Todd. I um, I was interested in your comments about kokanee down here in Oregon. Uh, we refer to kokanee as landlocked sockeye. That's right. If I followed your presentation accurately, all these fish you discussed access the Salish Sea, Georgia Straits, and some saltwater env environments. Is that accurate? The sea run cutthroat and the fjord fish, yes. The lake, the lake cutthroat that I was referring to, and the kokanee that are there, they do not. Okay, so they're found. They're found above velocity barrier, and uh, though they could uh, leave in a lot of these systems and trickle down, they don't. Um, they like like you you touched on there. There's there's two representations of kokanee. Um, and throughout the Columbia system, of course, there's lots because we put up so many dams in, right up into Canada. So wherever we dammed systems, the genetic for sockeye is so plastic and so moldable. In a few generations, they can go from a seven or eight pound sockeye down to a fairly small red fish with a green head. That would be what most people refer to as, as kokanee. Um, these fish particularly are actually more related to the ancestor of sockeye than sockeye. These fish cut off 
the branch way early, like seven to 10,000 years ago. So these fish have evolved side by side with these cutthroat in the same watershed. And when we see them, I mean, we do find some that have that resemblance with the green head and the red body, but most of them are a burgundy color and very dark. And we have two kinds. We have the shoal spawners or the deep water spawning uh, kokanee. And then we have river spawners and the deep spawning fish can actually spawn apparently I mean, it blew my mind, but a biologist told me this spring that they can spawn up to 60 feet deep. So um, that to me was was super unique. Um, I see them spawning between eight and 12 feet deep along the shore. Um, so they are, a, they are not landlocked sockeye. They are actually the real ice age old kokanee, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh Second question, our last speaker talked about um, how prevalent pink salmon have become. And his concern was they were monopolizing some of the forage out there in the oceans. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, that's a, that's a rabbit hole. Um, when it comes to salmon production, uh, I, I got to look at things on a, on a world scale. And and uh, you'll hear. I think I referred to the Pacific pasture a couple of times. Um, the Pacific pasture is a large stretch of ocean between Kamchatka and Alaska, and I mean between America, Russia, and Japan. I believe if we look at the numbers. We'll, there's more hatchery production of chum and pink than was ever naturally produced on the entire West Coast. Putting that amount of hatchery production out, and a lot of that falls into Japan and Russia, like they're they are they are ranching the Pacific pasture. I truly believe that we saw something this year that was unique. We saw it maybe seven or eight years ago as well. I think what we saw was string of hatchery fish on a large scale combined with huge ocean survival and straying. I mean, we, I saw thousands of pink salmon spawning in front of streams that don't get salmon this year in the ocean, on the beach, dying because there was some fresh water coming out of the gravel. And that happened, that happened and there was thousands of them. I mean, I've never seen as many pink salmon as we've seen this year. So I agree, something's happening. Um, I think there uh, it's a combination of unnatural production and better ocean survival and taking advantage of for forage, right? So I, I would have to say I agree. I'm not a, I, I definitely stick to trout and char. I know a little bit about what's happening in the ocean, but uh, it's not my specialty. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions. Anyone online? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for having me. <clears throat>